glad you're here today. We're in for a treat. We've got a friend in service with us ready to preach the Word of God, and uh, he's been a preaching machine all weekend, and if you've never heard Pastor Robert Madu, you are in for a treat. He's, he's really not a guest speaker. He's really a friend, and uh, that makes all the difference in the world. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And so I want you to get your Bibles out, everybody. Get ready. Big welcome to all of the other locations. We're all connected together. Highland, Germantown Parkway, Jackson, a bunch of people watching online today. You guys ready? Come on, you sure you're ready? You ready for the Word today? Come on, let's jump to our feet, everybody, at every location. I want you to give a big welcome to Pastor Robert Madu. Come on, come on, come on. Hey. Hallelujah. Come on, can we give Jesus a big hand clap of praise today? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. I'm at the Life Church. Hallelujah. Anybody glad to be in God's house today? Do you like who you're standing next to? Hey, if you don't, you still got time. You can change your seat. You can change your seat. Now, give somebody a high five as you sit down. Tell them it's on today. Hallelujah. Anybody glad to be in God's house? I tell you, I'm not just excited to be back at the Life Church. I am a Red Bull excited. I'm espresso elated. I've been waiting to get my face back in the place. And uh, this is not my first time here. Uh, I'm not a guest. In fact, I kind of adopted myself into the family uh, the first time that I came because I, uh, I love what God is doing in this house. How many know you are blessed to be a part of this church? Come on, I hope you know that um, the grass does not get greener anywhere else. Let me just tell you, you're at the right place um, at the right time. And I'm so thankful for your pastors who I just so look up to. And I think they're just living legends because of the way they serve and the way that they live. Could you help me thank God for Pastor John and Leslie for who they are? Come on, y'all can do better than that. I'm talking about your pastors, your leaders. They are the absolute best, and they really have the relational equity uh, to get anybody behind this pulpit, but I'm glad to have my face in the place, and I'm going to preach like I feel it today. Is that good? Come on, there's no doubt in my mind who the saved people are at the Life Church. Come on, when you come in the rain, then I don't know if God does extra credit in heaven, but you're going to get it, and uh, it's, it's going to be a good day. Let's jump straight into the Word. If you have a Bible with you across every location, uh, even if you're at home in your bathrobe, would you just wave that Bible in the air? <laughs> Like it just do care? Come on, Bibles are glowing. Thank you. You charged up your Bible. Go with me to the Gospel of Mark today, Mark chapter 2, and I'm going to look at verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2, we'll start at verse 1 and we'll land at verse number 12. And I really believe this word is going to encourage you today. And while you're looking for the gospel of Mark, how many of you actually have never heard me preach before? Can I see your hand if you've never heard me preach? Oh my goodness, that's almost everybody. Okay, um, <laughs> quick disclaimer. Uh, I am what you would call a holla back preacher. Okay, uh, all that means is um, over the next mm, six and a half hours uh, that we have together, if anything I say, anything I say is like resonating with you or you're feeling it, you can say amen, uh, you can say preach that, you can say, mm, that was good, uh, you could grunt, you could, uh, you could stand up in the middle and go, whoo, that was for me. <laughs> you could also stand up in the middle and go, ooh, that was for you, for real, you needed that. Any one of those will work, just get verbally involved today and it'll be good. Mark chapter 2 starting at verse number one, and it says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home, and so many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them, and since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law, also known as the haters, were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? 
Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. How many of you are thankful that you serve a God that has all authority? Come on, he doesn't have an inferiority complex. He has authority. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Can you say amen? amen. Come on, that's good all by itself. But I want to preach to you today, just using this as a title, I got more than what I came for. I got more than what I came for. Would you help me preach across every location? Would you look at your neighbor, whichever one you like the best? And just, uh, I'll let you pick. Just look at them and just say, neighbor. Oh, come on, don't be afraid to talk to your neighbor in church. You know I can see you. Come on. <laughs> say, neighbor. If you get to Jesus, you'll get more than what you came for. Come on, if you know that to be true, would you give God some praise up in here? Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. Lord, we're not gathered today out of religious routine. We've not come today to be entertained. We have come to be drastically changed. Speak to us so clearly and let us leave different than the way that we came in. And everybody who loves Jesus said, amen. I got more than what I came for. Life Church, 20 plus years ago, 20 plus years ago, if you came to a church and you were looking for me, you would not have found me behind a pulpit preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, but rather you would have found me in a kid's church Sunday school room, standing on top of a chair with my mini afro, singing a song at the top of my lungs that we sang every single Sunday. The song went a little bit like this, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Then you had to shout. Okay, seven of y'all went to Sunday school. <laughs> and uh, it, it just occurred to me that what began as just a cute little song as a kid has now transcended to a core belief. Because I really do stand upon the Word of God. I am obsessed with the Word of God. It is the hinge upon which my faith has its mobility. The Word of God is the irreducible, substantive essence of what it means to know who Jesus is. To those of you who think that book you're holding is some boring, antiquated book that doesn't really relate to your life, you have lost your mind. That is the only book that's still alive. It is the only book that's still breathing. It is the only book that has power. Uh, it, it's the only book that was written in antiquity, but yet it can speak to the specificity of your life. There is nothing like God's Word. You understand, other books you can read, but the Bible is distinctly different because the Bible will read you. It will show you who you are and whose you are. I love the Word of God. I believe the whole thing is true. I even believe the maps in the back. That's how gangster I am. I just, I love the Word of God. It fortifies me. It, it builds me up. But I got to be honest, I do have a favorite section. Come on, we all have our favorites, don't we? And I think my favorite literary genre in all of the Bible are the Gospels. I love the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just give me those four and no more. In fact, I've spent so much time studying the Gospels, I feel like they're close personal friends of mine. I call them Matt, Marky Mark, Uncle Luke, and little John. I love the Gospels because it's in the Gospels that we get to see the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. The Gospels pulsate with the personality of Jesus. I get to see how he walked, how he handled people and situations. One scholar said that the Gospels are Christology in narrative form. That's just a fancy way to say that the Gospels are the closest thing that we have of a biography of the greatest man who ever walked the f and his earth, and his name is Jesus. I, I love the Gospels. Here's what I love. I love that these four gospel writers are all talking about the same Jesus, but they do it in totally different ways. 
totally different. Almost like four film directors who've been given the same subject to film, but have each been given their own cinematic license to film it. Each one of them give us a different HD 4K view of who Jesus really is. And that's why I'm glad Marky Mark is our director for today. Because you know Mark is distinctly different from Matthew, Luke, and John, who primarily focus on what Christ said. Mark doesn't have time for that. He focuses on what Christ did. Mark is all about the actions of Jesus Christ. Mark is an action movie. If you like those movies where things get blown up and people get beat up, come with me to the book of Mark. Mark is so crazy, he don't even have time for baby Jesus. No, for real, read the book of Mark. You will not find a manger in the book of Mark. This dude skips Christmas and just goes straight to full-grown Jesus with hair on his chest, smelling like Old Spice. Mark is not playing games with you. Oh, Mark wants to let you know with clarity and precision that before there was a Russell Crowe in Gladiator, before there was a Mel Gibson in Braveheart, before there was a Denzel, my twin, hello, before there was any of them, please believe there was a King Jesus. And when he stepped in a situation, it had to come under his divine authority because he was not just a good man, he was a God man. He was God in flesh, walking among us with power in his hand. Ooh, I feel like preaching in this last service. And Mark chapter 2, our text for the day, the Bible says that Jesus, he's been traveling, he's been preaching, picking up on his frequent walker miles. And that's funny to me. And <laughs> He gets to a house, a certain house. Historians believe it's Peter's house. And the Bible says when Jesus gets to this house, all he does is he sits down to rest in the house. Just sits down to chillax in this house. And within minutes of him sitting down to rest in the house, all of a sudden throughout the entire region, people start going, Psst, hey, come here, hey, come here. Guess who just showed up? Jesus. Yeah, you know I can't miss that hair. Yes, Jesus is in town. Before you know it, people start getting on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and start putting the address on blast and dropping their location saying, hurry up. Jesus just got in town. And before you know it, the entire house is jam-packed with people simply because his presence sat down to rest in one house. Think about this, people from different walks of life, people from different backgrounds, all converged in one place because his presence sat down to rest in one house. Come on, the Bible is clear. It uses picturesque language. It says there wasn't even room outside the door. This is standing room only because his presence sat down to rest in one place. What is it about the presence of God coming to rest in a place that causes people to be drawn from everywhere. I'll tell you what it is. People instinctively know if you can ever get God's presence just to rest in a place. How many of you know something life-changing, something supernatural, something miraculous is bound to happen? Oh, come on. You don't believe me? Why are you here today? Hello, you do know it's raining outside, right? Like, you, you could have been at home today. You had every right to sleep in today. You could be at Cracker Barrel right now. Why in the world would you get up on your only day off, put on your good shirt, all that Mary Kay and Mac makeup, just to come into the house of God? You didn't come to hear the worship team, as awesome as they are. You didn't come to hear me preach. I think I know why you came. You came because you knew God's presence would be resting in this place. And when his presence shows up, oh, come on, somebody, something is going to happen. Come on, we came. We may as well turn up. Would you just take a praise break and just praise God like you want his presence just to come sit down? Oh, you do know he inhabits the praises of his people. When you start praising God, he goes, oh, I got to show up right there. Ooh, hallelujah. His presence, I love it, I love it, I love it because he hadn't even done anything yet. But just his presence caused an atmosphere of expectation to hit the room. Ooh, I can use my exegetical imagination. I can see them in the house. I can see the sick in the house going, if he touches me. If I just touch his clothes, I know I'm going to be made whole. I can see it. I can see, I can see practical things. Because, you know, my wife and I, we have three kids, four-year-old, three-year-old, and a one-year-old. Pray for us. And <laughs> because, because I'm a parent, I can see even practical things like a mom with a little kid, not even paying attention, just on his iPad. Just She's like, Psh, 
Well, pay attention. Jesus is in this house. We walked a long way. See, that's why you get in trouble at school because you don't listen to anybody. Listen to Jesus. He's going to change. I can see it. I can see it. I can even see some ladies in the house. Some ladies in the house because how many of you know Jesus was single and in the ministry? Come on, single people. You're going to be all right. Jesus can relate. I can, I can see some ladies in the house talking about, girl, Yeshua is fine. Mm-hmm. Girl, I heard last week at a wedding, he turned water into wine. Yes, he did. Mm-hmm. Don't let him ask me out on a date. I'm ordering water. I mean, I can see it. <laughs> I can see it. And they're all waiting. They're all waiting with tiptoe anticipation, perhaps to see what Jesus was going to do. Because everybody loves the show. But they should have been waiting to hear what he was going to say. Because the Bible says that all Jesus does in this packed house is he stands up. <clears throat> he clears his holy throat. And the Bible says that Jesus preached the word to them. That's all he did. He preached the word. Now, that not, might not get you excited, but that gets me excited. Because I love to hear people preach the word. You understand? God. You understand something powerful happens whenever you come in the presence of God and you hear the word of God being declared over your life. That's why you ought to thank God you're a part of this church that has a pastor that will preach the word of God. I'm telling you, this isn't an ordinary moment. This is an extraordinary moment. Something powerful happens when you get in God's presence and you hear his word. That's why Paul says just the foolishness of preaching can save a soul. Haven't you noticed anytime you get ready to make a decision to come to church, that's when all hell starts breaking loose. Your dog starts barking. Your cat goes cray cray. Your kids act like they lost their mind. Your ex from 1973 wants to text you all of a sudden. moment you make a decision to come to the house of God because the enemy knows if you can get in God's presence and you can hear his word come on chains will fall off of your life you get to understanding of your purpose and your destiny oh I love to hear people preach the word of God Ooh, I'm telling you this is how mature I've gotten I don't even care your style of how you preaching it if you're preaching the word I am with you I like calm preachers that preach the word and just stay in one spot and say this is my Bible I am what it says I am I can do what it says I can I like calm preachers that preach the word I like preachers that get real excited when they preach in the word and they got veins popping out of their neck and sound like they're having an asthma attack between each word got a Hammond B3 organ behind them come on you know those preachers they're more like this is my Bible I am what it says I am I can do what it says I can do. If it says I'm the head, I'm the head. If it says I'm above, I'm above. I'm so I mean, I like those preachers. <laughs> I preach like that at some churches, but I want to scare some of you here at the Life Church. I love to hear people preach the Word of God, but how many of you know in my text today, This is no ordinary preacher. This is Jesus. This is the greatest preacher to ever preach. Do you know I preached like I had six Red Bull this morning? Because I had six Red Bull this morning. No. (laughs) But you know why I preach with so much passion and I try my best no matter how many services or where I'm at to give it everything I got is because I know when I get to heaven, nobody wants to hear what I have to say. Come on, we don't want to hear any preachers when we get to heaven. Put your little podcast to the side. The only person we want to hear in heaven is Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Everybody else, sit down. I got to get my preaching out. Now, you understand that like when I preach or Pastor John preaches, we just have a word. Jesus is the word. You missed it. That means if Jesus really wanted to preach a good sermon, this is all he had to say. And he still would have been preaching. He was the word made flesh. And what would it have been like to have been in the room that day to listen to the living word preaching the written word? And there they are trying to pay attention to Jesus' sermon. But in the middle of the message, like church people today, they got distracted. Trying to pay attention. All of a sudden, they're like, is somebody on the roof? (laughs) 
they're trying to pay attention, but before you know it, debris starts falling down in the middle of this house, and a hole starts appearing in the roof, and a ray of sunlight starts coming through the room, and a few hands and a few heads appear as this hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and all of a sudden, in the middle of Jesus' message, they start lowering a man down, 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 down all the way at the feet of Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us his name, doesn't tell us his Twitter account, doesn't even tell us when his paralysis occurred. All the Bible tells us is that he is a paralytic man. Why is that important? I think it's important because if you study the Gospels, one of the literary nuances you will find is that anytime Jesus interacts with a person, rarely do we get their name. More often than not, we just get their gender and their condition. Have you ever noticed this? There was a man with a withered hand. What was his name? There was a man who was blind, a man who was deaf. There was a woman with an issue of blood. What was sister girl's name? We just get their gender and their condition. And do you know what it speaks to? I think it speaks to the human proclivity to identify people by their issues. People do the same thing today. We love to put labels on other people and define other people by their dysfunction. We love to put people in categories because it comforts our conscience to say, ooh, I know what they did. I know what she did. And you'll hear it when we talk about other people. I say, oh, you see him? Man, he's an alcoholic. Oh, you see her? She's a drug addict. Oh, you see him? He's on his eighth wife. Isn't it funny how people love to put labels on you? I found humans are the only people that will call you something for 15 years that you did one time in your past in five minutes and think the sum total of your life is some mistake that you made. But I got some good news from heaven for somebody today. How many are thankful that if you are in Christ, you're a brand new creature, your past gets washed away? Oh, when God sees you, he doesn't see your faults, he doesn't see your mistakes, he just sees the blood of Jesus and says, it has been paid for. Oh, I came to tell somebody today, you are more than your mistake. Don't define yourself by your dysfunction. Your issue does not have to become your identity. And they just label this man. They call him a paralytic man. And watch this. Here he is in the presence of God. He made it to God's presence and he still got his paralysis. He's in God's presence with his paralysis. I know you can't say anything in here today because it's church. You got to act real spiritual like you floated in here today and had communion for breakfast. But if we could be real, you'd be shocked, I think, that the person sitting right next to you who's lifting up their hands, singing all of the songs, but if you are honest about your current spiritual condition, paralysis. I'm talking about the thing that affects your walk with the Lord. I'm talking about the thing that maybe you cry out to God in a secret place and say, God, if I didn't have this, my walk with you would be a whole lot better. And maybe you're here or watching online and you feel like this man today, you feel stuck. You feel like people looking down on you. You feel like giving up. You feel like throwing in the towel. But God just happened on a rainy Sunday in Memphis to send this crazy, shouting, sweating, chocolate brother from Dallas, Texas to tell you, You can't give up. You can't give up. I'm telling you, God has a way of positioning you at the right place, at the right time, to hear the right word, so you can get up and walk in the effulgence of all that God has for you. Thank God for these four friends. Oh, these are the type of people I want in my favorites list on my phone. I want tear the roof off friends in my life. I don't want friends that want to push me into mediocrity. And when they see me on the ground, say, the ground is not that bad. In fact, Target got some more mats on sale. Let me go get you. No, give me tear the roof off friends. Give me people in my life who say, no, you got too much purpose on your life. You got too much destiny on your life. I don't know what to do about the situation, but I'll do whatever it takes to get you into the presence of a God that can. Come on get his legs. I'm going to get his arm. Now, Jesus is going to meet with you today. I will tear the roof off. Come on, let's pick him up. We'll find a way to get him on the roof. Come on, y'all. Come on, lift him, man. Whew. You've been eating carbs. I mean, they picked this dude up, picked him up, and tore the roof off. And no wonder Jesus responded to their faith. Oh, don't miss that in the text. 
their faith, not just the faith of the man, but the faith of the four friends who said, I'll do whatever it takes for him to get a breakthrough. And they tore the roof off. And how many know, if you're preaching a sermon and in the middle of your message, somebody comes through the roof, that's time to call the keys and just start shutting that sermon down. This is a huge interruption, and seemingly Jesus has lost the room, and the crowd is shocked that somebody has come through the roof, but they're also excited because this is what they paid their ticket to see. I mean, come on, it's already been rumored throughout the region that Jesus has supernatural, transcendent power. So as soon as the dude hits the floor, I can see the crowd going, oh, it's about to go down. I'm telling you, y'all, Jesus got power. He got real power. I don't know if he's going to take mud and rub it on his legs. I don't know what he's going to do, but it's going to turn out good. You better take your camera and put this on YouTube. And the man, the man who had to be embarrassed, had to be embarrassed to be lowered into the presence of all of these strangers. But all of a sudden, his embarrassment is eradicated with the feeling of elation and hope because he knows for the first time in his life, he's going to be able to stand on his own two feet. For the first time in his life, he'll be able to feel the sand between his toes. For the first time in his life, when he goes to a wedding and they do the cha-cha slide and it says, one hop this time, he's going to be able to do it. (laughs) While the crowd... (laughs) The crowd is waiting to clap at a miracle, and the man is thinking about the dance moves he's going to do. Jesus, who has the power to heal him, the first thing he says, the first thing he says to him is, son, your sins are forgiven. What? (laughs) Okay, all the super spiritual people in the room, you identified yourself because as soon as I said sins forgiven, you said or you thought, ah, hallelujah, glory to God, sin, yes, that is the problem. (laughs) But I don't know how you read the Bible. Here's how I read the Bible. When I read the Bible, I jump in the page of the Bible. I imagine what it would be like to be that particular individual in the text. And that lets me know that I probably would have gotten kicked out of the Bible. Yes, right around Genesis uh, chapter 1, because (laughs) whenever I am frustrated, whenever I'm annoyed, I have the tendency to be a little bit sarcastic, okay? Pray for me. I'm still in process. So if that's me, if that's me, and I've just been carried through a crowd, a scene has been made, I've been carried up the side of a house, a hole has been cut, and a construction has happened for me to get into the presence of a man that everybody's saying is going to heal me, and everybody's saying is going to make me finally walk. And the first thing, the first thing he says is not get up and walk, but is, son, your sins are forgiven. I'm going, oh, appreciate it, Jesus. You know, that's why we came all the way down here to get my sins forgiven. Yeah, that's the real obvious apparent issue, to get my sins forgiven. Yeah, I don't need these legs. I don't want to walk. I came all the way down here to get my sins forgiven. Hey, guys, sins forgiven. Mission accomplished. Let's go home. What is Jesus talking about? People, you got to read your Bible. It is funny stuff in your Bible. Jesus seems to be the only ignoramus in the room who doesn't realize this man didn't come to get his sins forgiven. Hello, he wants to do the moonwalk. (laughs) Oh, what do you do when Jesus does not address the thing in your life that you thought he should have addressed? What do you do when he does not take care of the need that seems to you be the most obvious and apparent issue to take care of? What do you do when you're preaching and it's thundering and you weren't expecting it? (laughs) My ADD kicking in. Because this man, just like you and I, didn't even realize he was in the exact place, the exact place that God will often reveal himself to you. Please don't miss this, church. There's a place in life that is frustrating, that is annoying, and yet it is often the place that God will reveal himself to you. And that place is this. Whenever your experience 
does it line up with your expectation? God is trying to give you a revelation of who he really is. That was so nice. I'm going to wind it to you, give it to you again. <laughs> Whenever your experience doesn't line up with your expectation, God is trying to give you a revelation of who he is. Because rarely is Jesus recognized. Often in our lives, he has to be revealed. And he will reveal himself at the place where our experiences don't line up with our expectations. Oh, I'm telling you, if I had time, I would take you throughout the Bible because the Bible is full of examples where people's experience didn't line up with their expectation and the whole thing was a setup for God to reveal himself to them in a deeper way. Oh, I'll give you my favorite. You remember John chapter 11? Remember Mary and Martha, their brother Lazarus gets sick out of the blue, just starts coughing. <laughs> I think I got the black lung, just starts coughing, and, and they don't trip at first, but all of a sudden it gets worse. They send a text message to Jesus and says, the one you love is sick. Please come, and Jesus does not come when he's sick. In fact, he tells his disciples, Lazarus is dead. Dead, I mean, excuse me, Lazarus is dead and not sick, and I'm glad. He doesn't even take his, he takes his time to get there, waits four days till after the funeral, and walks in cool, calm, and collected. Somebody, how y'all doing? Y'all good? Y'all good? Mary and Martha are like, no, he didn't. They're like, Jesus, I will cut you. Oh, they were so mad. John chapter 11, read it. They're like, if you would have been here, our brother wouldn't have been died. Their experience didn't line up with their expectation. They thought that he was going to heal him when he was sick, but he didn't. He waited till he was dead, and not just dead, four days dead. That's dead. Four days dead. And right when their experience didn't line up with their expectation, he goes to the grave and preaches a three-point sermon and says, a Lazarus come forth, and a dead man came out of the grave. Thank God it was a three-point sermon because you know his word is so powerful. If he would have just gone to the grave and said, come forth, every dead person in there would have been like, hold on, he's talking about me. And it would have been a thriller video. So I want to thank God he can get the right word to the right person at the right time so the situation that looks like it's over, oh, come on, somebody, he can bring it back to life again. I feel like preaching in here. Somebody, a situation in your life looks like it's over, but it is not over until God says it is over. Ooh, start playing softly so I can land the plane. Can you see, can you see Mary and Martha? Can you see them taking the grave clothes off of their brother who was dead? Tell my girl, Jesus, off the chain. Man, you stay. See, I thought he only had power to heal people when they were sick. I didn't know he had power to raise people from the dead. And girl, we would have never known resurrection power was in him until our experience didn't line up with our expectation. Thank God he didn't heal them when he was sick. We wouldn't have known that he was the resurrection and the life. I'm telling you, the situation you're complaining about, you could flip the script today and start praising about it because the whole situation could be a setup for God to reveal himself to you in a deeper and more profound way. Is this helping anybody today? Sometimes it's not until you get the bad doctor's report that you get a revelation that he really is a healer. Sometimes it's not until you watch people you thought you could trust stab you in the back that you'll get the revelation that he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Sometimes it's not until your money is funny and your change is strange. <laughs> and you got more bills than you got income that you'll get a revelation. No, he really is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. How's my bank account going down, but my belly's getting bigger because I'm still eating and he's still providing and still making a way. What is he revealing to this man? He says, son, your sins are forgiven. Only a savior can say that. And in that moment, that man had to be thinking, oh, Jesus, hello, my legs. Oh, why did I come to you? You don't know what my problem is. 
And Jesus goes, no, you don't know what your problem is. Because you think your legs are the big issue. Your legs are just the fruit of the issue. Sin is the root of the issue. And I've got to deal with the root of the issue before I deal with the fruit of the issue. So I have to tell you, your sins are forgiven. That was the first miracle. Jesus could have literally said, your sins are forgiven, and walked out the room and left him on the floor. And how many know he still did a miracle? He still did a miracle. Because you are better off being paralyzed and forgiven than to be walking in sin. But you ought to thank God he can do both. He don't want you paralyzed with a promise or walking in sin. Come on, he wants you walking worthy of the call that is on your life, stepping into everything that he has for you. Come on, that's why he said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He looked at this man and said, I tell you, get up. Somebody say, get up. Get up. Oh, say it like you got some power. Say, get up. get up. Oh, come on, say it like you got some faith. Say, get up. Somebody came all the way to church today to get those two words. Get up. God is taking you to a new place. Get up. Your calling is too high for you to live that low. Get up. Come on, somebody say, get up. Oh, get up from worry. Get up from fear. Get up from anxiety. Get up from the pain of your past. Get up from depression. Get up from doubt. Get up from stinking thinking. Get up from low self-esteem. Get up from the chains of the opinions of other people. Come on, somebody with faith today. Would you just shout, get up? Oh, you're about to step into everything that God has for you. You've been on the ground too long. Somebody shout, get up. Get up! Hallelujah! Oh, I can see this man. I can see him getting up. I imagine the entire place erupted, giving God praise, because he who was down was now up. And if you're not up yet, could you get up? I'm (laughs) close. And I love Jesus, because he's not just powerful, he's practical. Because if it was me, I would have ended the miracle at get up. But Jesus says, get up. And then he says something else that when I first read it made me laugh out loud. He goes, get up. He goes, oh, and take your mat. (laughs) The man had to be thinking, "Uh, Jesus, I'm good. You know how long I've been laying on that mat? He's like, nah, bro, you're not good. Take your mat. And he had to be thinking, why do I have to carry this silly mat around? And I think it's because Jesus didn't want him to ever forget that he used to be down on the ground. Oh, come on. See, if you're not careful and you've been walking with the Lord for a while, you'll start turning up your nose at other people, but you better look at your mat. Your mat is a testimony. Your mat is a reminder of where you should have been and where you could have been if it had not been for the grace of God in your life. Come on. You know you wouldn't be caught dead in church before, but look at you now. You got a mat. Does anybody in here have a mat of where he's brought you from? Your match, your testimony, it reminds you of where you could have been. Last thing he tells them is, go home. Go home. And I can see him knocking the, on the door of his house. Because he may be his wife and his kids going, Dad, Dad, you're, you're standing. What, what would you, you're standing. And he looks at him and says, Ooh, family, you can't even see the real miracle. The real miracle is not just that my legs have been healed. The real miracle is that my sins have been forgiven. He dealt with a thing that nobody else could deal with. I thought I was just coming for my legs, but he exceeded my expectations. Maybe he told him the title of my message, I got so much more than what I came for. My legs are just proof positive that healing has occurred on the inside. Because God will always heal you from the inside out. I just believe the same Jesus that did it for that man is willing and able to do it for you in this place today. If you'll let him get to the root of the issue.